Okay, so now uh, we are moving to Australia and uh, we have here a Professor Fritz uh, Geiser, uh, the Director of the Center of Behavioral and Physiological Ecology uh, in uh, New England University in Australia. So the one thing I can tell you uh, about Australia is that this guy that came uh, to Australia to visit the plane lands and he goes to immigration and in immigration they start to interrogate him. Have you been to a farm? Have you been here? Have you been there? You know, for half an hour interrogation. Then he gets fed up with it and he says, well, this is the last question. So no, there is one more. Is it an important one? Oh, very important. If you answer it wrongly, you are back on the next plane. Okay, what is the question? Well, do you have a criminal record? He says, oh, I didn't know it was still a requirement. Uh, okay, so what we are going uh, to hear about from uh, Fritz is diverse function of torpor. Please. Thanks. I came with a plane, not with a criminal, criminal record. <laughs> Where's the pointer? Oh, there it is. Okay. How far do I stay away like this? I guess everybody here will know that humans and mammals have, can have a high constant body temperature, usually around 37 degrees Celsius, so that's shown on this side here. And therefore, they're called homeotherms, that means a constant body temperature. And to be able to do that, they have to be endotherms, which means they have to make heat internally. And how that's working is shown on the right side. So when it's very, very warm, that's just basically metabolic rate, which is usually measured as oxygen consumption. That's just an easy way to do it. When it's very warm, they can have a metabolic rate that's basal because the heat loss is very small. This is basically just cost of living. When it gets a little bit colder, the metabolic rate goes up, and this is called resting metabolic rate, so this is just for keeping warm. And you can see that the metabolic rate here at five degrees Celsius is manifold of basal metabolic rate, and of course that needs a lot of food, and of course a lot of food is not always, always available in the, in the wild. And because of that, not all endotherms are always homeothermic. There's quite a few which are heterothermic. And those are the arms which can go into torpor, like Norga talked about before. And they, when they want to do it, they also can thermic the boil temperature at high uh, values here, but they also can lower it. And so the boil temperature follows over a wide temperature range, like the ambient temperature here. And over that temperature range, the metabolic rate goes down usually in a curvilinear fashion like this. And you can see the energy expansion there is of course much, much lower when they're cold than when they're at warm temperatures up there. But if this would be a lizard, it would become colder and colder and colder and freeze to death. But heterotherms actually can control the boil temperature when they're in torpor. So you see a, a platform here at 10 degrees Celsius. And that of course costs energy, so the arm will have to increase uh, their metabolic rate. And this value here depends, uh, varies widely among species. It can be at 20 degrees Celsius or at 5 degrees Celsius or at 0 degrees Celsius or whatever. But the main point is, of course, is the, of this is they save a lot of energy at certain temperatures. Now, this is very hard for you to look at. It's easy to look at it as a time, a function of time. So this shows now uh, metabolic rate here and body temperature over a day on the bottom here, the armor was exposed to a temperature of about 18 or 19 degrees Celsius. When the armor is active or resting, its metabolic rate is high and its body temperature is high. And you can see at about midday or at midnight, the armor went into torpor. You can see its metabolic rate plummets, it falls to very low values, and body temperature falls as well. And the metabolic rate stays low for several hours in this example. And then, of course, for the armor to become active again, they have to rewarm. So they make a huge amount of heat, which is shown by this peak here, to push the body temperature up to where it was before. And then they become active again. So the energy they save, if this is a resting value and that's a resting value here, and you draw a line, it's basically the curve underneath that line minus that overshoot they need to push the body temperature 
uh, up to high values again. Now this example is for daily torpor. The torpor metabolic rate is about 10% of that uh, during rest and it lasts for a few hours. The body temperature usually falls to about 15 degrees Celsius or so. And hibernation is actually quite similar, but the difference is that the torpor metabolic rate is only 1%, so they have basically no metabolic rate at all. It's very, very low of that, and they stay down for about weeks. And the body temperature is usually about 5 degrees Celsius, but it can be actually zero or less than zero degrees Celsius. Brian Barnes is going to talk about that in the next talk. Okay, now, this looks great. The almonds have great thermal tolerance, which is probably interesting uh, for medicals here. So some almonds can go to zero degrees Celsius. Humans die at 20 or 25 degrees Celsius usually, and they basically can turn the metabolic graph off to almost nothing. But of course, if you read textbooks, you always get the impression this happens only in very, very few species in hardly anything at all. And that's actually not correct at all. It's very, very diverse. So torpor occurs in all mammalian subclasses. Monotremes are egg-laying mammals. They're in Australia and in, in New Guinea. Marsupials are plus, uh, pouched mammals. They're in, in Australia and in South America. And then placentals, that's things like wheat, bats, and rats, and pigs. Of course, the pigs and rats don't, don't go into torpor, but a lot of the other species go into torpor. So it's very diverse. And some people actually made estimates that up to half of all mammals use this sort of... Uh, adaptation for survival. But deep torpor, so those are animals which drop their temperature by more than 10 degrees Celsius, so mainly occurs in, in small species. So this is about half of all mammalian species. And you can see most mammals are actually little. The most mammals are rats and mice, not humans and lions. And they are the ones which go into torpor. And the reason for that is, of course, because then you're, if you are smaller, your relative surface area is bigger, you, you lose a lot of heat to the environment, and they use that for compensa compensating it. Okay, so torpor saves a lot of energy. Metabolic rate is usually uh, below 95% in comparison to normal thermic animals, to warm animals, and it's very effective in dealing with energy demanding situations like cold exposure and food shortages. And therefore, it's widely believed that torpor is crucial for survival of adverse conditions in non reproductive animals in winter. But people widely be, or very often believe that they do not go into torpor. Uh, when they were produced because of hormonal and also because of uh, energetic uh, incompatibilities. And this is the logical thing to do if you are a little hamster, for example, living in Siberia. They're mainly in Kazakhstan. They're called Jungarian hamsters. They're very widely used as lab animals. In summer, or if you give them a long forty period, they're brown, they're heavy, they make babies, they don't go into torpor. In winter, or if you give them a short photo period, they turn totally white. Uh, they are light. They even change their skeleton. Uh, they become non or they're non reproductive and they go into torpor. So if you, even if you keep them at warm temperatures at 18 degrees Celsius or so and give them food at lip, they still do about a third of the, of the time they display torpor. And this is, of course, a logical thing to do because it's very cold in winter and warm in summer. They get plenty of food in summer and spring, but not in winter. And this is also the case for Arctic ground squirrels, for example. They will reproduce in summer and hibernate in winter when it's very, very cold. And you probably all would agree with me, it's a good thing to reproduce when your environment looks like this and not like that. If you're in the Alps, you probably don't want to reproduce if you're a small mammal in winter. But not, not all animals live in, in environments like this. You, lots of animals live in the tropics and in the subtropics, and you may think that animals in the tropics and subtropics don't go into torpor. Think again, a lot of species do it. And for example, food availability, especially nectar availability, often is actually higher in winter than it is in summer. So there's different food availabilities in these sort of habitats. And of course, deserts are very different again. In deserts, and many deserts, it's sort of not that cold in winter, but really, really hot in summer, like around here. If you have temperatures between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius and no water, it's probably not a wise thing to reproduce. It'd be better off doing it in winter. And so I'm going to uh, investigate here, are there other functions of torpor in relation to reproduction? So reproduction costs a lot of energy. Is it and torpor always mutually uh, exclusive, or do some people, uh, some animals use it? And of course, development is also very challenging and can torpor be used to overcome that. So basically for a section talking about reduction and then a little bit about uh, uh, development after that. Now, you probably 
or are all aware of that, that if arms are reproducing, apart from running around for mating, they have to increase their metabolic rate. This is for mother. She has to get food and basically deliver it to the baby. This is the sort of normal energy expenditure here. And then it goes up during pregnancy, and it goes up like crazy during lactation. So it's very, very expensive. And you can do that if you've got a lot of food. It can raise your metabolic rate. But if you live in the Australian desert, for example, this is a, a carnivorous marsupial. They're like 100 grams or thereabouts, or 50 grams. They uh, reproduce in, in winter. So this is, of course, Australian winter. So they're made in June, pregnant in July, and they lactate in August. And that, that's the distribution range. Basically, the wet bit is up the top in the tropics and on the east coast, and everything is pretty much dry. Uh, and actually, the field side, I just wanted to mention that, because when I drive over here, when I come to Israel, I'm always shocked how quickly you can get over to the Dead Sea in, in two hours. When we go to our field side, my university is here, and the field side is there, it takes us three hours to drive there. So just driving 3,000 kilometers. Okay, so other animals reduce in winter. And a few years ago, I wanted to do a descriptive study on them, because basically nothing was known about them. And I just sort of looked at the animals and measured how often they went into the But This is a very hard slide to read. So basically what it tells you is each time the dot goes up, the animal went into torpor. And if it goes sideways, it did not go into torpor. So I observed the animal, and it had that food at, had food at libitum, and they were kept under warmish sort of temperatures. So you can see basically every day along here, the animal went into torpor. And I thought, so that's going to be a nice sort of descriptive thing. And then suddenly, I had babies. You know, it's like three or four days before birth, they stopped going into torpor. So afterwards, I found out that this animal actually was pregnant throughout my measurements. And the, the most interesting thing is, I mean, apart from that, I did torpor frequently during pregnancy, is that I increased the body mass. So normally, when animals go into torpor, they burn fat to become lighter, and they actually packed it on. So the interpretation of this was that the animals tried to use torpor to pack on fat, which they can use later on for reproduction, for, uh, for lactation. Now, of course, this was done in, in the lab. And you never really can trust lab studies. You really have to go out in the field to check if things are really correct. So we did go to the field and with the study. This is actually Uluru there. Some people may have been there, uh, AS Rock. And our field site was just next to it. And this is the armor with a little uh, data logger there for measuring bowel temperatures. And those are the different individuals measured with, with uh, temperature transmitters. And it measures body temperature fluctu fluctuations over time. M is, of course, male, and F is, of course, female. And you can see during the mating period, the males were, of course, running around looking for the girls. They went into torpor a little bit, had very, very big home ranges. But the females, even during the mating period, went into torpor already. And then during the pregnancy period, females all went into torpor. Basically, every day, they drop down, come up again, drop down, come up again. Very, very intensive torpor. And after mating, the males started to do the same thing. And the only time when the armor were homeothermic, when they did regulate the body temperature, is this bit here. When we record this one armor, she had new pouchang, new babies. And so it looks like during lactation or late during pregnancy, they do not go into torpor. But it seems to be correct. They use pregnancy for storing fat for lactation. That is in the field. And an example for another marsupial. This is a Danart. This is one of the biggest genera. They're basically distributed over Central Australia. There's quite a few species of these. And you can see that's in the lab. A non-pregnant animal shows torpor like this. This is just metabolic rate measurements there. And still a pregnant animal goes into torpor. It's shorter and probably shallower. But for comparison down there is a non-pregnant animal. You can see it's very, very uh, different, of course. Now, you may ask yourself, maybe this is a uh, marsupial thing, because marsupials have tiny babies. They're basically like a rice corn when they're born, like maybe 10 or, or uh, 20 milligrams. They're hardly developed at all. But what about things which have big babies, like for bats? This is a blossom bat, and they actually don't live in the desert. They live on the, in the tropics and in the subtropics. And they have very large babies, single babies. And you can see even the blossom bat gives, goes into torpor during uh, pregnancy. This is a normal blossom bat here. They're active at night, and they show torpor in the morning. And I know it's not as nice as that one up there, but you can still see a torpor about down there. So the, this blossom bat shows torpor during pregnancy. And even a more uh, extreme example is a hoary bat in uh, southern Canada. That's an interesting species. 
they migrate to uh, California and Mexico in winter, and when they migrate back in spring, they're pregnant, and sometimes they get caught in a uh, uh, cold snap, which is in this example here. And you can see that during this cold snap, the armor went into torpors on a temperature, the ambient temperature went down to about five degrees Celsius, and the boy temperature source pretty much tracked that. So normally people say it's a bad thing for the arms to go into torpor because it takes them forever to produce their babies because everything gets delayed. But in this case, it was just a good thing because they didn't give birth during this time, but rather they gave birth after when the temperatures were more benign. So the mother and the baby has basically a better chance uh, for survival. And torpor during reduction has been found in quite a few species now. The numbers are going up all the time. So you get it during mating. So microbats actually males in caves warm up in the middle of winter and they go around and rape females. Sometimes they use males as well, which is quite amazing. Echidnas seem to do the same thing and Malgaris has shown you before, so we don't know exactly. It just happens during torpor or in between. Sperm storage seems to be very common. There's a few question marks because the data are not that strong, that's just indirect. Torpor during pregnancy in many, many species Echidnas, Dasyurids, Megabats, Microbats, Tenrex, even rodents now, Dormice do it, and mouse lemurs, of course, small primates do it. And lactation, people thought this would be totally impossible, quite a few species do it. And even birds, hummingbirds doing, doing uh, incubation, and poor wolves do it during incubation and brooding as well. So it's very, very widely distributed. And the thing is, the data are usually not very good because people don't like taking food away from pregnant or for, from reproducing animals. So often the data are just sort of accidents where people just stumble across something. So people don't often go out and do experiments to, to work out if they can do it or not. Okay, so after reproduction, of course, comes development. And this is a difficult slide to explain for people who are not used to looking at this. So this shows the basal metabolic rate for marsupials. And it's mass specific, so it's per gram tissue. And it goes down, so the bigger an animal is, the smaller its metabolic rate per gram. This is just a relationship. We still don't understand why this is. This is sort of a general thing. But most animals, when they are born, they are naked and helpless, and they can't thermoregulate. So initially, their metabolic rate is really, really low. So when they look like this, when they're naked or neonate uh, mice, they have a metabolic rate which is below what it should be for their group. Then in the middle, when they grow a lot, their metabolic rate overshoots. They have a very high metabolic rate because they have to put down tissue and become bigger, so it becomes expensive. And then they come back to the line again, which is predicted for them. So if we take animals like this, which have a very low, low metabolic rate, and these would be in the middle here, growing, and these muscles here would be these uh, when they're still basically ectothermic. They're not ectothermic, but similar to. Now, if you take these animals and take them away from the nest and the mother and expose them to ambient temperature, they cool very quickly. So initially, you can see they cool very close, very quickly near ambient temperature when they're very little, like this. And as they grow and fur develops, the cooling stops. And basically here, when they look like that, this sort of size, they stop cooling, they can thermoregulate. But because they are like this, they're only about a third or a quarter or maybe half of the size of adults, their loss of heat is enormous. And to survive during that time, they don't know how to feed properly. If the mothers don't find any food, they are in trouble. So the best thing for them would be to go into torpor. Uh, I've got another slide before I go into this. This is just the same thing again, the end point from the, of the cooling experiments. So this is for Smithopsis, again, that's uh, the arm I showed you before. If you expose them to 33 degrees Celsius, the boy temperature still goes up a little bit from three grams to about 10 grams. And of course, if you expose them to 20 degrees Celsius, the boy temperature goes up from about 23 to about 34 degrees Celsius or so. If you look at the metabolic rates down there, it goes up a little bit at 33 degrees Celsius, which is thermoneutral. And of course, it goes up a lot uh, when you expose them to 20 degrees Celsius. And this is the point I try to get across. They have a huge energy expenditure here to keep the biotemperature stable. And they should go into torpor to save energy. And this is exactly what they do. So the question is, can they go, go into torpor at that stage? And they do. So at nine grams, you can see they show these beautiful torpor bars for half a day or so. 
at 12 grams, a little bit less, and at 16 grams and 80 grams. And you can see as they get bigger and heat loss gets less, they basically reduce torpor with growth. Now you may think this is again a marsupial thing because they're so tiny and have such slow development, but a very similar thing happens in, in placental mammals, in hamsters. So this is a hamster from Inner in Mongolia. They're quite interesting. They reduce very late in the year, like in, in September still, just before uh, winter hits. That neonates are here, they weigh, weigh about one gram. And if you expose those animals to 20 degrees Celsius, initially they're warm in the nest and then they cool down very, very quickly. This is just a thermal camera picture. And as they get older, you can see they can, it becomes yellow and yellow and redder. And at 15 days, they can keep their body temperature stable. At 15 days, they look like this thing here. They're very small, like five grams of their rows. And the question again was, can they go on the top at that time? And they can. So you can see that at 16 days, only one day after the arm, it becomes endothermic, they already can uh, display torpor. It's a nice torpor right here and a couple of torpors there. And this just shows the distribution range of the arms. They're basically found in, in uh, uh, Gobi Desert and in Inner Mongolia of China. Okay, so torpor during development in the kidneys, uh, in monotremes in the kidneys. In marsupials, there's about five species now. In rodents, about four species, one species in shrews, one bat. There's probably more, but they're no good data. And then quite a few bird species show as, as well. So do the functions of torpor go beyond energy conservation in winter? I think, yes, they do. That can be important for enabling reproduction and development on limited resources. Thank you. They don't do it. But don't marine mammals do torpor when they die? No, they just, they just reduce their, their metabolic rate because of the diving reflex. But they reduce their metabolic they rate? They do, but they have, to, they have to repay that later on. That's going to be an oxygen debt. They're going to really cold water. They don't lower their temperature? Um, no. Like, you don't have marine mammals. They keep their water. There's, there's not one example of a marine mammal going into torpor, I'm aware of. I know torpor in a penguin, in baby penguins, king penguins going into torpor, and that's quite new data. But as it, it's, you know, with the new equipment, we've probably found many more species which do it. I've got no doubt about that. So at the moment, we just have, you know, 1% of the, of the diversity we know. There's so many species that haven't been looked at. Uh, there's, there's many papers written on that. <laughs> well, it, that's just that's for uh, for a glass of red wine, I think. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>